breaking the wall that limits evolution. How sexual recombination accelerates adaptation. Nick Barton, Institute of Science and Technology, Vienna. Where I was when the Berlin Wall came down, I don't remember. So, thank you for the invitation to speak here, and thank you for coming to listen. Um, this meeting is about breaking walls, breaking the walls that limit our understanding of the world, breaking the walls that separate different disciplines. Um, and many of the talks, like the talk we've just heard today, will be about immediate human problems and how we can try and solve them. But what I want to do is do something rather different, and I think the, the talks in the, in the first session will be uh, following me will be rather like this. I will be taking a much longer view. I'll be going right the way back to the formation of the planet 4,500 million years ago, to the origin of life just after that, and then following the, the long span of evolution through to the present extraordinary diversity of life that we see around us. And what I want to do is uh, to explain how it is that sexual reproduction works with natural selection to build up the extraordinarily complex and sophisticated organisms that we see around us. How it works by breaking the walls between individuals. So when we look at the, the living world, we're impressed by all kinds of extraordinary adaptations. For example, the eyes of the owl, which can detect just a few photons of light. The antenna of a female moth, which can detect a few molecules of a pheromone sent out by a male many kilometers away. We are impressed by the sophisticated social structure of a beehive, by the elaborate behaviors of, for example, a, a new Caledonian crow there, digging out uh, insects with a very simple tool, a little stick. And perhaps we're most impressed by our own brains, the human brain, which has laid the basis for a new form of evolution, the evolution of ideas rather than the evolution of genes. But most of the living world is actually invisible to us. It consists of single-celled organisms, which in their own way are just as extraordinary. I've just shown a few rather random pictures here. Uh, but these organisms can display an extraordinary biochemical versatility, an extraordinarily precise genetic system. And indeed, we all share, all living organisms share this basic genetics, basic biochemistry, a basic system that allows us to replicate our DNA with extreme accuracy, with less than one mistake per thousand million copy, copying events, to uh, carry out precise uh, reactions, to catalyze specific reactions at ambient pressure, ambient temperature, something that's completely beyond the reach of human chemists. And we all share this common genetic system, which descends from our common ancestor, the common ancestor of all living organisms, which lived about 3,600 million years ago. So don't try and read the detail on this. This is just a schematic picture of our current understanding of the tree of life, the relationships between all living organisms. And at the center, labeled the root, is this common ancestor. Shortly after that ancestor lived, life diversified into three domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. And all I want to emphasize from this picture is that almost all of these organisms are single-celled, are invisible microbes. And the organisms we're familiar with, ourselves, the animals, the fungi, the plants, and so on, are tucked away up in the vast ancient diversity of the eukaryotes. And arguably, perhaps one of the most important transitions in evolution was the emergence of the eukaryotes about 1,800 million years ago. And these organisms are characterized by a complex cellular structure. I'm contrasting on the left, the bacteria. On the right, a much larger eukaryote cell in which the nucleus uh, encloses the genetic material, the DNA. And there are many other cellular compartments uh, which carry out specific functions, photosynthesis, respiration, and so on. And this complex structure arose through an ancient symbiosis, through a coming together of different organisms. An ancient microbe engulfed two or more species of bacteria. The genes from those bacteria were gradually incorporated into the eukaryote genome, into our own genomes. We are a mosaic of bacterial and archaeal uh, genes. And the remnants of those symbiotic bacteria still carry out today the key functions of respiration, 
of photosynthesis, and perhaps other functions. So the eukaryotes diversified into a whole range of mostly single-celled organisms, but also including bottom left, green plants, bottom right, the animals, jellyfish there. But these multicellular organisms, these large organisms, the ones we can really see in the fossil record, they only emerged relatively recently. Recently meaning 565 million years ago. Recent relative to the long span going back 4,500 uh, million years. And the first soft-bodied forms occurred around 565 million years ago and were followed uh, shortly afterwards by a radiation at the base of the Cambrian into uh, a whole range of uh, organisms which we see in the fossil record. The conventional fossil record starts around then. And so we see this very, very long span of evolutionary time. And the things we think about when we think of evolution are really much more recent than that. Uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, the diversification of the primates, our divergence from the chimpanzee and the gorilla lineages, all very recent on this time scale. And of course, human history, written history, agriculture, absolutely occurring in the twinkling of an eye, set against this long span of time. So what I want to do is to ask two questions, two very closely related questions. One, why is sexual reproduction so widespread amongst the eukaryotes? I said that the eukaryotes are characterized by this complex internal organization in their cells, which arose originally by symbiosis, by a coming together of different organisms. But they're also characterized almost entirely by an organized process of sexual reproduction, by the coming together of different cells to merge, to produce a diploid, that is an organism, a cell with two genomes, and then by a complex process of meiosis in which these genomes are aligned, are broken and rejoined to produce new combinations of genes. And this process of sexual reproduction coming together and the separation, the coming together and the separation of genomes, the reshuffling of those genomes, this seems to be essentially obligatory across the eukaryotes. And connected with this, how is it that such complicated organisms can evolve, can diversify? Given that the eukaryotes have larger cells, typically smaller population sizes, slower reproduction, disadvantages in evolution, and yet they've diversified to produce extraordinarily complex and sophisticated structures. So what I'll be trying to do is really just sketch out the consensus view that's emerged over the last century or so in evolutionary biology, but also at the end to hint at the breakthroughs that are in progress with the current deluge of data from DNA sequencing. So the existence of sexual reproduction is really completely baffling because, you know, it's a lot of trouble. Why do we bother? I mean, finding a mate, you know, it's, it's difficult. Difficult for single cells who are swimming about. How do they find each other? It's hard to accurately recombine genomes, to line them up, to cut, to rejoin without making mistakes, without generating errors, a slow, expensive, difficult process. And once we've gone to all this trouble, we produce new random combinations of genes, randomized gene combinations that have been built up by selection, that are favorable, that work well together, and then we reshuffle them at random. And in the short term, that brings a cost, a measurable cost. So immediately after sexual reproduction evolves, there's a specialization into males and females. Males producing large numbers of small gametes, females doing all the work, providing the resources, providing the large eggs, etc., providing parental care in higher organisms. And that leads to an immediate so-called twofold cost. A female who produces entirely daughters will increase in the population at a rate twice that of a sexual. There is the possibility of spread of parasites, venereal disease, and so on. And there is the evolution of sexual selection, in which males waste their energy, waste their effort, making large displays, fighting each other, stag beetles fighting uh, other males for mates, flowers uh, displaying uh, in an expensive way to attract pollinators, etc., etc. Why? Why does this happen? It's a, it's a real puzzle. And basically, the answer is simply that in the long term, sexual recombination is essential for natural selection to work effectively. And so to explain this, we have to understand why selection is so effective. Now, the problem is to understand how selection can pick out from the vast space of possible DNA sequences those tiny fractions which actually work, which actually produce organisms that can survive, that can reproduce. 
only a tiny fraction of DNA sequences will work, will be fit. And a process of simple random selection from random variation will simply be ineffective, it's hopeless. There has to be a stepwise process of building up slight changes that increase fitness, that increase fitness, and move towards, by gradual accumulation of individually favorable changes, move towards eventually highly improbable sequences in a stepwise manner. So I can skip through this. So favorable combinations of mutations have to be brought together. And this is very difficult in the absence of sex. So here we have a simple diagram showing on the horizontal axis time flowing forward. And we imagine we begin with little a, little b, two genes, which don't work so well. Big A is favored. Big B is favored. They each increase. The red showing the increase of one type. The green, the increase of another mutation. But they can't come together. You can't get big A and big B until let's say A has fixed in the population, and then B. Things have to work in series. They can't evolve in parallel. Almost all the mutations that occur at any one time are wasted, because only one of them can win. They compete. And indeed, asexual species do not persist. They tend to go extinct. They may do well for a short time, but over time spans of hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, they will not persist. Selection is only effective in the presence of recombination. Selection and recombination have to work together to bring together these combinations, big A, big B, here. And in this diagram, you see a little twist on the story, which is that any gene that favors recombination or favors sexual union, that favors the production of these fit combinations, A with B, uh, indicated there by the little circle, that gene, let's say M, which causes increased recombination, will itself gain an advantage by being associated with the good things it produces, with the novel combinations that it produces. So my, my contribution to all this has really been to uh, develop the, the mathematical theory, to quantify the advantage to sex and recombination, and to show that in principle it can actually uh, give a sufficient advantage to spread, to maintain sex, despite its obvious costs. But until recently, although the, the theoretical development of, of many people working in the field had been quite mature, we had very little data to check uh, the theory with. Suddenly, we have abundant data from the genome sequencing projects, uh, which is actually quite disconcerting. To go from a field in which there was virtually no data to a field in which we suddenly have samples of thousands of genomes, complete genomes, from many different species, is, is really quite disconcerting. But soon we will, I think, have a good quantitative understanding of the extent of selection. We'll know whether selection is sufficiently uh, strong uh, to actually account for the extent of sex and recombination. Um, we basically know that there is a steady rate of molecular evolution across most of the genome. Some regions, functional regions, are constrained to evolve more slowly. A few uh, change more rapidly. And indeed, it may be that most of the differences between species are driven by selection. I have seven seconds before the terrible cough will come, so I shall wrap up. Uh, we basically know now that selection is highly extensive, is uh, <coughs> consistent with uh, the theoretical requirements for the maintenance of sex and recombination. So I hope I've given you at least a hint of the way in which a uh, combination of theory and data can explain this basic feature of the living world. Okay? Uh, thank you. <laughs>